I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of. You know, I was just standing in line at the at the coffee shop. I got to chatting. I like to chat with people. I got to chatting with this guy in front of me. Turns out he was doing this interesting thing. That turned into an interview. That turned into a job. I love and the best job I've ever had. And I'm just lucky. So you're not lucky. You're constantly surveying the universe and you're looking for patterns, patterns of communication, patterns of uh, friendliness and openness. And when you find those patterns, you, you act. Hey, Bill, thank you for coming on, man. Welcome to Arion Talks. I appreciate it. I, I thought it would oh, be nice. Thanks for inviting me. Then, no, thank you for coming. I thought, I thought it would be nice if we started with defining the sign thinking. Sure. You know, design thinking, um, we used to call it human-centered design back when I was at, at Stanford. But design thinking has evolved to be kind of the go-to innovation strategy for lots and lots of companies. If you're trying to design something new to the world, an iPhone, or when I was at Apple, we were designing the first laptops. Cool. If you're trying to design something never been done before. Well, you can't really do a lot of research because it's never been done before. <laughs> and so you, you got to come up with a way with these, these innovations. And, and the way we do it is we we have this method we call design thinking, where you start with really doing a deep dive on what people need. What's their, what's the need that's behind the need? Not just, oh, everybody wants more battery life for their, for their cell phone, but what do they really want to do with their cell phone? And then you come up and then you reframe the problem. You come up with lots of ideas, but the real key is you, you build a lot of prototypes. David Kelly, our senior um, professor and the guy who started the D school and started IDEO, the big you know, international innovation firm. He says, we, we build to think. We actually make stuff to try to figure out what we're trying to do. Because when you're, again, you design something new to the world, it's impossible to research what it would be. I mean, you can talk to people and you can come up with ideas, but you really have to build things and try them. I know when they were building the iPhone, they showed it to Steve Jobs three times. And they said in the, in the biography, that Walter Isaacson's good. Um, and three times he said, no, it's not good enough. Do it again, do it again. So they just kept prototyping and prototyping. So design thinking is a human-centered process. We start with people, and then we figure out what's an underlying need. And this is a great way to design products or services or experiences. People are using it to design strategies. You can you know, come up with like systems thinking or urban planning to design cities. It's a really good way of coming up with you know, innovation. No, that's great. And when did you, you and Dave realize that this could potentially be used for life design, for designing the life that you want to create for yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, Dave had been teaching a class over at Berkeley uh, across the Bay and on trying to help students with this problem. Well, how do I, you know, how do I launch what I do after college? You know, how can I, um, How can, I, how can I find a good thing to do that has some meaning, maybe some purpose? Um, and uh, I had just taken the position at Stanford in 2006. I came in, for, I've been teaching at Stanford for a long time, but just part-time while I was working in industry. But in 2006, I took the full-time position of the executive director of our design program, the program I graduated from. It was really fun, really cool. And, and about 2007, Dave came over and he said, hey, Are your students having the same problem the Berkeley students are having? I'm trying to figure out how to launch, you know, and like what's up, you know, they're, they're procrastinating and they don't know what they want to do and they're not sure they've got the right major. And, you know, all, all the, you, you know, I talked before we went on, on the podcast about, you know, this is kind of what's going on. People are confused. And, and you know, and, and I've got to say, colleges are terrible at helping people. They might have a career center. If you know what you want, you can go to the career center and say, hey, can I get an interview for a software job? But if you don't know what you want, it's, it's, it's really a struggle. Anyway, so Dave came over and said, do you think that would work? I said, yeah, but we've got to do it through the design lens because I think it's really a design problem. Hmm. And so we, you know, we like to we use our design process to design. You, you know, we, we built a prototype. That summer, I got six of my students, uh, three had graduated and three who were seniors. And we just ran two little workshops, two, two hour workshops, a Wednesday night and a, and a Thursday night. And at the end of the Thursday night session, The student said, this is amazing. You've got to make a class. Uh, in fact, we wanted to end 
the session and the students say, no, 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 we're not done yet. We, we want to talk about this because, because nobody's talking about this with us and we really need help. So it was clear to me, first of all, the only thing I know how to do is teach design so and do design, I've design in my whole life. So um, I wanted to apply this to that. But, but like, think about it. Um, empathy is the first step in design thinking. Why well, empathy for myself? Who am I? What do I really, what do I really like to do? What am I good at? And then empathy for the world. Just because I want to do it doesn't mean the world cares, right? <laughs> I got to match my needs to the world's needs. So that's a classic design problem. Then redefine the problem. This next step. I mean, everybody's trying to optimize their life. You can't opt. There's no one perfect version of you. There's lots of great use. And designers know you, you brainstorm lots of solutions before you pick. So redefine the problem. Brainstorm lots of solutions. And then prototype. You know, uh, this this interview is a prototype. You're you're prototyping. What would it be like to be a design thinker? What would it be like if I lived inside Bill's world? Mm -hmm. And you know, and you can and, and you can you know try that on and see how you like it. I teach my students how to have prototype interviews, talking to people, and how to have prototype experiences where they go try something. Because you know, we're not just brains. We're we're a whole embodied intelligence. We need to feel what it feels like sometimes. So all those things just fell into place and we built a class and uh, for the seniors and went really well it was a long you know we only did it once a quarter once a year so there's a long waiting list to get in and then we um then the vice provost of undergraduate education a guy named harry ellum who was used to be at stanford um he uh, he said hey can you build a class for the freshmen because the freshmen are having trouble figuring out how to do stanford Hmm. We said, sure. So we did. A, we have a designing your life for the seniors, a designing your Stanford, how to design your college experience using design thinking for the for the freshmen. And then the provost, if you do something for the undergrad, you got to do something for the grad. So the provost of graduate education, um, a woman named Patty Gumford said, hey, can you do something for the grad students? Because even there, they're kind of confused. They, they're getting a PhD, but they don't really know what they want to do. <laughs> so now we teach all three classes, plus a lot of little workshops and stuff. And um, it's gone really, really well. But it, it, it's just because I'm, I'm not in charge of your life. You know, all, our system is, let me teach you some ideas and let me teach you some new tools, ways of thinking about problems so that you can unpack the problem and really understand it. Hmm. But more than that, it's a way of taking action. You know, one of the mindsets of a designer is bias to action. How can you actually try something in the world and see what it feels like. So all the pieces fell into place. The students, you know, were really feeling good. Now we have lots of other schools are teaching it because we we give the curriculum to anybody who wants it. And as a researcher down at uh, uh, University of California, it's uh, Dominguez Hills, and um, she is uh, she's amazing, Dr. Heather Butler. She's been studying this. She's a psychologist, so she's been doing lots of testing and research students who don't take the class versus students who do, and what's the impact? And it changes people's self, self image, their, their the ability to think of themselves as being in control of their life. It, lo it lowers their procrastination, it ups their hopefulness. Uh, Martin Seligman, the famous positive psychologist has a scale for, for flourishing, he calls the PERMA scale. Each letter stands for something and it improves their PERMA scores, it improves their confidence, so we're pretty sure we're doing something that's useful for sure for sure and it's obviously a lot easier once you take the class but let's say uh, a college graduate is just listening to this and he wants to get started right away you know that bias to action what's the first step that he could take to start really designing his life <laughs> Well, I mean, one step you could take is you could go buy the book, Designing Your Life. Um, <laughs> of course. Um, and if, he's in, if, it's, if, it's already, if you're already work, working, we wrote another book called Designing Your Work Life. So those are, those are good, two good places to start. But, the first, but normally when I start with a student, I say, all right, let's, let, let's just do a, some quick, real quick. Give me, write me 250 words, 500 words, a couple short paragraphs on, you know, your work view. What's, what's work for? Because we're going to talk about life and work, and that's how, you know, we're going to move forward. So they write down what they think work is for. And then I say, okay, now give me 250 to 500 words, a couple of short paragraphs on your worldview. What's the big picture? Why are we here? 
Okay, so now I know what your theory of life is and your theory of work is. Now let's now, now it doesn't, and you can have any theory you want. You can say the world is, you know, is a, it's all about being kind to other people. You can say the world is a crazy place and I, and it doesn't matter. You can say, I believe in a, a deeply in a spiritual faith and that's how I organize my life, whatever it is. What I'm looking for is what we call coherence. Because the research says when you can connect what, what you want to do with the big picture, why are we here, the world, like when you can, Dave says, when you can connect the intimate to the ultimate, you want to do to the big picture and whatever your pictures, when those are coherent, people have better mental health, they have a higher sense of self-worth, they believe their life is meaningful, right? Because you can connect, you know, like, I know what I'm doing. Why am I a student? Why am I working? And what's it, what's it for? So that, we call that, that's your compass. Okay, so now you've got, now you've got something to test against. Okay, I kind of know why I'm here and I know what I'm for and, and it, it matches. And sometimes it doesn't match, you know, money mm -hmm. and your life view is I want help other people. And sometimes you have to, you have to, you know, really have to think about it and match things up. But once you got to test your ideas and then, the, and then we do one of the, the next one, but you would just, I want you to do three completely different plans for your life. We call them odyssey plans because they're odysseys, they're, they're adventures. Hmm. One plan is I finish school, I go get a job and let's say I was a computer science major, I go get a job and I write code for Google. Second one is, I don't want to work for big companies. I want to do something else. I mean, a social entrepreneur, and I'm going to go help kids uh, in this program in my city who uh, are disadvantaged and they need help learning uh, tutoring for reading. The one thing I'm going to go make a lot of money being a coder. I'm going to work in a social entrepreneur, you know, to help kids. And then the third idea is your wild card. Okay. What would you do if you didn't have to worry about money? Don't worry, you'll have enough money. Well, be, well, be rich, but you have enough. And you didn't care what your parents said or what your friends say. It's like, you know, like, but you got this great degree. Why are you going to, and, and, and your wildcard plan is, I want to be a clown with Cirque du Soleil. You know, Cirque, Cirque, Cirque's the big, yeah. you know, crazy circus that's amazing. I'm going to go to clown school. Then I'm going to get a job at Cirque. And I'm going to be a clown. And everybody's like, you be a clown? I just use that as an example. It's a, it, it works at Cirque. She was a gymnast, so she can do, you know, um, <laughs> crazy things uh, in the air. Anyway, so now I've got three completely different versions of my life. I'm not going to necessarily do one of them. It's not, that's not the point. The idea is to get used to brainstorming options. So I've got a compass. I know what, I, I don't exactly know where I'm going, but I know how to stay on track. And I got three completely different plans. And what happens when you do three, not just one, is all sorts of stuff comes up. Stuff from your childhood, hopes and dreams you had when you were little, ideas that you have that you, when you put it on paper, you're like, ah. by the way, you, you, there's three dash, there's a da dashboard that you do with these plans. And you know, how much do you like it? How coherent is it you know, compared to your compass? Um, do you have the resources to do it? So you rate the plans. And sometimes people build plans and they go, I don't like this plan. <laughs> and I go, well, that's interesting. You, you built it. Why don't you like it? And they go, well, this is what my mother wants me to do. <laughs> or my parents want me to do, right? But it's not me. And I go, all right, let's get rid of that plan. And you've got that voice out of your head. Get rid of that plan. What, what do you want to do? So it's just an exercise, much like uh, I, was look, I mentioned, I was looking over the, your, your blog and you had James Pennebaker on. And talk, it's the idea of writing. So we write out these things because when you write it, when you when you name it, when you can read it out, to, out loud to people, when you name it, you can you claim it. You claim it as yours. And sometimes you read it and you go, hmm, that's not me. That's somebody else's idea of my life. Not that's not my life. So we do some reflection, come up with a compass, we write three plans. Just that I've seen. There's lots of other workshop exercises, lots of other things we do in the class, but just those two. Two things, make a compass with your world and work view, do three plans. It changes your mindset because we're all, while we're working, you, you know this, but we're working on how do you think, 
you know, you, you know the you know uh, uh, closed versus open mindsets, right? Carol Dweck's work, or you know the work of Angela Duckworth, which I'm talking about grit and perseverance. How do we persevere? Um, so we want to we want an open mindset, and we want to open ourselves to possibilities. And it's not like you're going to do one of those three plans. You're not actually going to go be a clown. Maybe you will do. Maybe not. you're not necessarily going to take the you know the software job at the big company. But when you have all three plans, you start to realize, wait a minute, there's a lot more possibilities than I thought. And if I choose to go this way, it'll I work with will be different. The experiences I have will be different. How do I feel about that? Back to empathy for me. Me, I'm going to pay you. You know, one of our, our things is to blow up, you know, dysfunctional beliefs, bad ideas. And one of the, I think is pretty bad is this question all my students get asked typically by, you know, somebody who's trying to be helpful. They say, well, just follow your passion. Mm. You know, if you knew your passion, you'd be all set. No, me too, right? So the point of view is stuff up. This isn't just Bill's ideas, Bill and Dave's. So we went over and we talked to one of the researchers at Stanford who runs the Stanford Center for the Study Lessons, study of you know how people grow up into their full mature self. And in his his book, uh, his name is Bill Damon. Uh, he'd be a great guy to interview. And his book is called Path to Purpose. And in his, his research, only 20% of the students he talked to had any identifiable passion. And all the, 80% of the students would say, I don't know, or I've got lots of passion. I don't know, I've got lots of things that I'm excited about, no one thing. And so when you hear the question, well, follow your passion, you know, what's, what's your passion? Hmm. And you don't have one, you think, oh, I must be the only person. When actually eight out of 10 people don't have one. Yeah. <laughs> so and and the research says passions passions emerge after you get really good at something you try something and you find out you're really good at it and then you get really you know really into it so we don't believe in in questions that make you feel bad <laughs> and that question makes it out of 10 people feel bad we don't we say well, you don't need a passion you just need a curiosity like, yeah. what are you interested in let's try something so I'm sorry, long, long answer, long professor answer. Do the work for your worldview, come up with a coherent point of view on that, your compass, and then do three completely different plans for your life, make one of them a wild card, and then reflect on what, if, what do I see and how do I feel? Yeah, de definitely connecting. I see how having three different options opens your mind and allows you to explore what you said before that maybe uh, one, plan one plan was the plan that your parents carved out for you. The other plan is something that you want a little bit more, but it's not helping other people. So you're not going to find that intrinsic motivation that you get from helping other people or just helping the world in general. Yeah. And afterwards, you mentioned that bias for action, that actually getting in contact with people in that field that are doing something similar to that plan and talking to them before even starting to, it's like dipping your toes in the water, you know, before actually committing to something, you talk to people that are already doing it. So you realize if this is, if this is something that you actually want. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so talking to people and trying stuff is really important. Like, um, I had a student who, you know, all her life had wanted to be a doctor and she wanted to go to medical school and she was a very good student and she had very good scores and, um, and she got into medical school, but she wasn't quite sure about it. And I said, well, have you ever been over to the, we have a big, you know, Stanford School of Medicine. It's a very large school. Have you ever been over to the School of Medicine and talked to doctors? She said, no, you know, uh, I tell your parents doctors. She said, no. I said, well, here's your assignment. You, I want you to walk over and to make an appointment with a couple of doctors and just say, I just want to talk to you about your career and tell me, how, you know, find people that you think are doing interesting things and go over there and talk to them. And she, and she did. And she talked to two doctors and she came back and she said, you know, 
when I walked into the into the building, into the medical school building, I just got a funny feeling in my body, like this wasn't this wasn't the right place for me. And as I was talking to the doctors about their experiences, and they were very positive about they liked being doctors, I realized what they actually do every day isn't anything like what I thought doctors did. Hmm. Um, and I realized what I really want to do is medical research. I don't want to be a doctor. <laughs> and I said, well, that's, a, that's great. And you're very well prepared for that. But that's a completely different thing. Medical school, you know, four years of medical school and a residency, you know, that, that's an eight year commitment in your life. You want to, sounds to me like what you want to do is get a PhD and be a researcher. And she said, yeah. And that, that, I said, well, before, check that out. Let's go talk to five researchers. She then she said, I walked into the lab. I was so excited. There was all this cool equipment and they were doing these amazing things. And, you know, stem cell research right now is the leading edge of stuff. And I really want to do that kind of stuff. I said, what? When you came back from the medical interviews, your body was like, oh, so sad. When you came back from the research interviews, you couldn't stop talking. <laughs> I'm not telling you what to do. But I'm just observing, in one case, you had lots of energy and a real positive you know, kind of energy. And in the other case, you were full of a lot of questions. So sit on that for a while and tell me what you think is the right choice. And of course, she chose to be the researcher. But you know, it's like we, we make decisions about our lives with almost no data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, 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 why'd you want to be a doctor? I always wanted to be a doctor. When you were a little kid, you played doctor and it was fun. But that's not data. That's not what a doctor is really doing. So, so I just, you know, if people get out in the world and try stuff, they, they can learn so much. And what I, and, and, you know, my students are a little shy and they don't, they don't think anybody will talk to them. And our, our data says 70% of the time, if you read, and if this is the request, Hey, Antonio, I just, I just read about you in a, in a, in a, in a article. And then I went to your, blog and I looked at all, all these all these amazing people you've interviewed. Um, you sound like a really cool guy and I love your mission. Could I can I get 20 minutes or 30 minutes of your time and just ask you about like how did you start this thing and what's what are you doing and what why are you so excited about it? I mean you're gonna say sure I love talking about my thing. Right? I love talking about my thing. Everybody likes talking about themselves. If I say hey Antonio can I get a job you know on, on your blog that's a different that's a completely different yeah right I mean, because now I'm asking you for something and you don't even know me. Yeah. But if all I do is just, if I'm just curious and I genuinely want to know, what's your story? People love to, love to help. And so we make it an assignment in the class. The students have to do it. And they're really worried about it. We give them like lots of preparation. And we give them a little, you know, we give them a, a subject line for the email. And, and they think no one's going to talk to them. And then they have these amazing conversations. <laughs> And that gets them started on a new practice, you know, just getting out in the world and trying to so radical collaboration is the other mindset. So the, the five mindsets are curiosity, because we're all curious, right? Take your curiosity for a walk, go see what happens, right? Radical collaboration, because the answer is not sitting in your head somewhere thinking, thinking you got to get in the world, try stuff. So, uh, curiosity, radical collaboration, mindful of process, because sometimes you look looking for lots of ideas and sometimes you're trying to narrow and you got to know where you are in the process of course because you know the answer's out in the world um and when you do those things you do them well and then and then prototyping of course you know prototyping is these little experiences right these little experiments once you once you adopt those mindsets you're living a completely different life this is this is the transformation we were talking about before we we started recording it's like you guys are trying to help people, uh, particularly you know young people who are just launching out of out of college or in college, and they're not getting any like they're looking for some help on you know what to do and how to think about the future and that kind of stuff. And and our argument, there is no one, two, three simple version. You know, here I'm going to give you three things to do, and then your life's going to be fine. Because your life is complicated, my life is complicated, life is. It's just complicated. And now you got this massive disruption of a global pandemic. And I don't care what plans you had, those plans are, you know, gonna change. But, you know, we also have other massive disruptions, climate change, the social crisis in America right now, the, the racial, the racial injustice and all over the world, you know, re-examining 
um, class and race and sexism and, and ageism and really trying to make a more equitable world and, and the climate disaster. And we're running out of energy. I mean, there's lots of, <laughs> lots of things are gonna change the future in, un, un, in you know, unpredictable ways. So you better have a strategy that's resilient. And the only strategy I know to move into an unknown future is to think like a designer and be designing that future. And then when the, when the circumstances change, you redesign. That works, I know that works. Having a rigid plan, I'm gonna to go to school, I'm gonna get this degree, I'm gonna practice this thing. You know, I don't care what it is. You know, AI is coming with AI, big data, machine learning, the automation of many jobs. Most of the jobs that people are being trained for in college right now will disappear in the next 10 to 15 years. So you don't wanna be in a situation where, you know, you thought you had it all figured out and then it goes away. So you need a strategy that's more resilient, more open-minded, and design is a, is a great strategy. Now, I mean, not just, as, you know, not just design, you should, you should still plan. You can plan to save money so that you have money for, you know, for when you get married or when you want to buy a house or when you want to send your kids to college. There's things you can plan for. But the things that really make life worth living, you know, they happen as much by luck as they do by planning. Yeah. And we have to be open for this type of luck. I've also heard you mention that people who consider themselves lucky tend to identify situations where some, some luck might spring up. Yeah. yeah. How can we really, you know, cultivate that mindset of just attracting this luck? Yeah, you know, there's, and again, it's, a, it's really, a really interesting piece of research. Um, I'll, go, I'll do it real quick. So some researchers were looking at this thing about is that, why do people think they're lucky? So they had people rate themselves on a scale of one to 10. Are you lucky? One, no, not very much. I don't know why bad things always happen. <laughs> Eight, nine, 10, yeah, I'm pretty lucky. I don't know, good things always happen. So that, you know, they had a scale and then they had them do a task. And the task was to, um, they had this newspaper and it was like 20 pages or 30 pages like the front page of the New York Times or something. And uh, they said, count the number of headlines or count the number of photos in this page. And if you get the right answer, you get $100. That was the, that was the experiment. Of course, you know, when there's an experiment, that's not really the experiment, right? There's a trick. <laughs> it was a fake newspaper. It looked, it looked real, but it was fake. And, and inside the, the articles, there was a little piece of text inserted every once in a while that said, hey, if you read this, the experiment's over, collect an extra $150. Okay, so the data was the people who didn't seem, think of themselves as lucky did the task, got the right answer, got the hundred dollars, felt pretty good. The people who rated themselves as lucky, something like eighty percent of the time, found the little piece of text, quit early, and got the extra hundred dollars. So the just conclusion was that the lucky people are just paying more attention. Yeah, they were supposed to count how many, you know, headlines or pictures there were, but they also were kind of, you know, paying attention, looking around and reading some of the articles, and then they, they caught this little thing. Hmm. So luck is more a matter of possibilities, it's keeping your emotional intelligence turned on. And when you see something interesting, responding to it, instead of just doing the task at hand. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you the number of people I've talked to in, in my, I do a, uh, stuff on campus, but I also do workshops for people in their 30s and 40s, kind of in the middle of their career. They're thinking about doing a change or something. They need some help. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of. You know, I was just standing in line at the, at the coffee shop. I got to chatting. I like to chat with people. I got to chatting with this guy in front of me. Turns out he was doing this interesting thing. That turned into an interview. That turned into a job. I love and the best job I've ever had. And it's just lucky. So you're not lucky. You're constantly surveying the universe and you're looking for patterns, patterns of communication, patterns of uh, friendliness and openness. And when you find those patterns, you, you act, you, you bias action. 
There's another guy in line just behind you, just on the other side. He never talked to anybody. He got his coffee. He left. He went to work. You turned it into the best job you've ever had. You're not lucky. You're just aware. You're open. And you have a curious mindset. Oh, I wonder if this person's interesting to talk to. Now, you know, I'm an introvert. I don't normally talk to people, you know, in line at, at the coffee shop. But I am a curious person. And sometimes my curiosity will get over my shyness. And particularly when I see something that's interesting. Uh, and there must have been something that, you know, that person must have been doing something that was interesting for the other person to say, hey, what are you doing? Oh, hi, how are you? I'm, I'm getting, you're getting coffee, but I noticed you've got this thing. Tell me about it. Oh, yeah, we're building this new portable computer. Really? I, I do computer design. Yeah, yeah, you know. You should come talk to us. So it, stay open, stay curious, and take action when you see something that's interesting. Because like the people who didn't just do the job and get the right number, who saw the extra little pieces of words that weren't supposed to be there, but were there you know, because it was a trick, they're the ones who, quote, got lucky. Now, did, you know, does, does actual luck, it's like, does the universe care about what we do? I don't know. I mean, there are many ways to the top of the mountain. My way is design. You know, there's other, other, other ways of organizing your life. But when humans are naturally curious, I know that. And if you lean into your curiosity and take your curiosity for a walk, it comes up sometimes. Yeah. And that's awesome how curiosity, I feel, is like the baseline of your strategy. And it's, you also mentioned it to be the baseline of luck basically yeah it is i mean at least that's that that one piece of research is you know there, there are other there, there are other things in this in that space um and it's uh you know again we, we since we teach at stanford i can't just say uh oh be curious you know there's a there's a uh we we use a lot of the positive psychology work work from you know martin seligman and michaeli checks on the high and dan goldberg and dan gilbert and stuff uh, and Goldman and Dan Gilbert. Um, but we also use some of the work um, from the folks who do what's called, um, I think it's called social determinism theory. And, and they, they postulate that humans are unique and that we have three intrinsic motivations hmm. that we do just because we do them, not because we get any reward. In fact, the classic, the classic experiment is I give two people a puzzle to solve because people like mastery and competence. So they like, they like to solve puzzles. I give one team, just solve the puzzle, you know, and I'll time you and if you get the best time, awesome. And the other team, I said, I'll, I'll pay you 10 bucks to do this puzzle. If the team that I pay $10 does worse than the team, I just do it for, for the joy of doing it. Because when you take an intrinsic motivation and I pay you for it, I make it an external reward, the, the motivation drops. But the three are, you know, we're, we're uh, we call it the arc of your of your career or the arc of your of your humanity. In in the second book, it's like autonomy. We like to have autonomy. We like to say, "Well, I did this." You know, I, mean, I, I like to I like to be able to claim ownership of the, my work. Uh, relatedness. I like to work with people. People we're naturally social animals. I I am motivated to create relationships. And then competence. People just want to get better at stuff. They want to master anything that they do. They want, you know, they have a they have an intrinsic motivation towards mastery. And particularly when you align that with something you're good at, it's easy to be motivated. You know, the 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 you, you talk, we talked a little bit about procrastination. It's a big problem for people. And I know you had some experts on there of their own, own, own ways of dealing with procrastination. Um, yeah, and 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 I, you know, I I procrastinate. Everybody procrastinates, but but when I'm doing something that I'm intrinsically motivated to do, when I'm mastering something new, or I'm really learning something about other people, or I'm connecting my relationships in a way that's that feels, you know, powerful or generative, I don't have any procrastinating because I'm using my internal, my my intrinsic, my natural motivations. And everybody's curious. Yeah. And you might be curious about something unusual. And it may not be something that you can make a living at, but it's still something you're going to be motivated to do. 
think, I mean, think about video games. Think about online gaming, video games, all these games, you know, um, uh, that, that, that people play. They play for mastery, right? They want to be the best player. They want the highest score. There's no money. There's no, there's no goal. There's no, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make you a better human being. But I want to have the highest score at, with Worlds of Warcraft. And, and then the gaming companies did one other really smart thing. They made the game social. My son, who's, you know, 27 and, and, and plays games, he plays games not because he cares about the games. He plays games because he gets on his headset and then and five of his friends log in and they play together. That's confidence. I want to get better at the game. And I want to play with my friends. The video game companies have intrinsic motivation down cold and that's how they hook it. yeah and intrinsic motivation is actually the first uh, week of our program is we use something called ikigai i don't know if you've heard about it it's it's basically aligning um the work you do with helping uh the world and something right. that could also give you money so it's like four pillars that really tackle that intrinsic motivation in terms of your job so it's uh really important and as you said autonomy as well ownership all those things are super important for not only overcoming procrastination but i feel there are important things to look at when you're choosing a job uh, yeah yeah i i agree you know um Let's talk about choosing jobs a little bit because um, you know people <laughs> get sure. really really nervous about choosing jobs, right? Assuming I have an offer or an opportunity to, to get a job, um, you know, is it, am I going to like it? Is it going to be the right one? I don't know. You know, what I get there and it's boring. Um, I, my students say, I don't want to work for a big company, and I go, well, what do you know about big companies? Oh, they're boring. I said, really? You know, like. You think working at Apple's boring? I put there. It's not boring at all. It's pretty exciting. Um, and when you do something at Apple, a hundred million people get it. You do something at this little startup, maybe a hundred people get it. You know, so it's a think about it. But but this notion that that work is gonna that that um, I, I believe that work should be purposeful and meaningful. But that's a pretty new idea. For sure. You know? Um, and that's a pretty privileged idea. I'm having enough education to get a job that's you know meaningful. Now, my grandparents came from Germany. My grandfather got the, his family out of Germany in 1933. 1933 is a pretty important year because that's the year Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor of Germany. Turned out very well. And so he was able, you know, because he had a few, a, a, a brother who was already To, he and my grandmother came to the United States with my mom. Um, they didn't speak any English. He had a sixth grade education. My grandmother had no education. But, and, but he took any job he could take. They actually ended up in California eventually. That's where, I'm, where I started. I grew up when I was very young in California. Um, and he took a job, any job he could take because his, his motivation was to get Family safe, put a roof over our head, send the kids to school. Okay, I'm looking for job satisfaction, but his satisfaction came from knowing he was he was doing good, he was doing the work he needed to do to make his family safe. And it was real. I'm truly like existentially safe. Like if they stayed in Germany, he would have been, you know, recruited into the military, and then he probably would have died, and you know, family would have grown up. So his motivation, and he had, he had his other, his, the joy in his life came from his community, his, the church and his fan, friends and family. And there's a big immigrant community in, in California. So he had a rich life, but his job was a job. The job was to make money, keep his family safe. Now, next generation, my mom didn't go to college, but her brother went to college. My mom, you know, married a person who went to college. Uh, so my dad went, you know, to the community college and got a degree and worked very hard, but was, you know, also motivated by a satisfying job. He sent his son to Stanford and I got, you know, and I got a great job and I'm very excited about all, this, all the jobs I've ever had. They were all fun. And my daughter is getting her PhD in stem cell immunology cool. at UCSF. So in just four generations from 
poverty, speaking no English, take any job you've got to jobs that are really, you know, wonderful, motivating, passion, you know, job, passion filled jobs. It's a big change. And there are a lot of people who are still at the level of like, I just need a job and yeah. I need some money because I need to make, my, I need to help my family get to the next step. And so I want to be careful when we talk about meaning and purpose mm -hmm. to make sure that we include things that are not just about the yeah. job because not everybody's going to, and you know what? Um, we talk about there's your vocation, what you do for money and your avocation, what you do for love. You might not want to do, you know, let's say you you work and you do your you know, thing and it's good and you make enough money and you support your family, but you love to write poetry. And so you write poetry and maybe even you go to open mic nights and you do a poetry reading or you go to poetry slams or whatever. Now, do you really want to write, you know, you really want to write poems that people want to pay for? Those are called commercials or jingles or something like that. That's a different thing. You might not want to do the thing you're doing for love and for art and for you know for the for the for expression and truth. You might not want to do that on the market's terms because then you'd have to change what you're doing. So keep your vocation and your avocation separate. Sometimes they're the same, but they don't have to be. And and if if you have a good job where you're doing good work, but you still don't feel like you have the meaning or purpose in your life the first place to look is well what's that meaning and purpose about and almost always about helping others right this idea you talk about it's about helping others whatever the four pillars are you might want to do that work but not on the market's terms you know i'm over here i'm a software programmer i'm writing code for a food delivery app who cares it's another food delivery app it's good money though and it's intellectually stimulating over here, I'm writing music and producing music with my friends and we're releasing, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, um, mixing on GarageBand and we're releasing it to SoundCloud or Bandcamp and we're putting our videos on YouTube. And guess what? We got a thousand followers. Yay. <laughs> but this is about expression and creativity. And frankly, I don't want to, I want to write the songs I want to write. I don't want to write the songs that, you know, some pop star would sing. So, so be careful. It's not always the same thing. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And it's a new idea, a very new idea, just in the last 30 years or so, that everybody's going to have a job that's full of passion and full of purpose. And we're all going to be doing good. It, 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 sometimes, but not always. And, and there's nothing, if your job is just good, but not um, great, Count yourself lucky, because most people hate their job. This, in the U.S., 68% of workers say they are disengaged from their job. They're disengaged workers. Globally, Gallup does this poll. Globally, I think it's 82% of workers say they don't. They, they come to work, but they they don't care. They're disengaged. Japan has the highest rate of disengaged workers of any industrial country. 92% of Japanese workers hate their job. Damn. <laughs> you know, so uh, does that mean everybody in Japan is, is sad? No, they have rich cultural lives. They have rich social lives and other things. But, but their job, their, 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 the way they structure jobs and companies is really broken, at least by that data it's really broken yeah i think they also have like the highest uh, burnout rates right yeah they have the highest unfortunately the highest suicide rate um they actually have a japanese word for death by job hmm. um and it's uh, it's very sad you know we, we have a designing your life um group in in japan and we're trying to figure out how to help people with life design um and they they had just launched a bunch of of different workshops when the you know pandemic hit um but we're again we're going to start running workshops again in japan very shortly and cool. i'm very excited because i'm hoping that you know people find this way of thinking that it'll, it'll help them maybe modify the way they work or modify the way they approach their, their jobs and stuff and that could be helpful all That's of this work by the way it was just around trying to be helpful and you know our students 
were unhappy, we want to try to help them, you know, find different ways to express themselves. I meet lots and lots of work. You know, when I do these workshops for people in their 30s and 40s, and I say, who's unhappy? And people raise their hand. 80% of the time, that's a very successful banker, a very successful finance person, a very successful venture capitalist, a very successful lawyer, or a very successful, you know, CEO. And he or she is unhappy because they got they got lots of money, and they got no meaning, zero purpose, and they found themselves chasing, chasing, chasing to get them more promotions, more promotions, more promotions. You know, go to the best law school, go to the best business school, go, go, go. They get somewhere, they got some money, and they look around and they go, "I don't want any of this. <laughs> uh, this is this doesn't mean anything to me." They've completely lost their compass. They've, they've chased money. The psychologists call it the hedonic treadmill. You know, you chase for, for high, you get a little high and then it goes away. And so you gotta get more, right? Well, I got a promotion, felt pretty good for six months and now it just feels normal again. Maybe I need another promotion. Maybe I need to get another degree. Oh, I'll get an MBA. Everybody tells me MBAs so make a lot of money. And then I get an MBA and then I get some money and then, and then I don't care anymore. And then I get some more money and I don't care anymore. Pretty soon you find yourself you know, burned out and and going, well, how the hell did I, you know, the number one question they asked me is, Bill, how the hell did I get here? I'm really successful. All my friends tell me, I'm, I'm this is a direct quote, all my friends tell me I should be so happy and I'm miserable. How did I get here? And I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. But from what you've told me, Somewhere along the line, you stopped asking yourself, how does this feel? Does it feel right? Does it feel good to me? Like we all, we all can, if, if we can consult our, our inner emotional intelligence, there's, a, there's someone in there, you're chasing the wrong thing. This isn't making you happy. You know, you're chasing the wrong thing. And, and then, you know, and this, this same person said, well, yeah, but now I'm, you know, I have a lot of money. I have a big house in Manhattan. I have a house in Long Island. You know, my friends all tell me I have a perfect, I've got the perfect life, the perfect job. My kids are in private schools. I need a lot of money. I said, no, you don't. All of those things are external. You could change any of them. Sell the house in Long Island. Sell the house in Manhattan. You know, you've got reason. I mean, I, 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 I'm, always I'm always confused when rich people tell me they don't know what to do and they don't have any resources. You've got lots of resources. I'm working with people who have no money, no job, no college education, and they've got a growth mindset and they're working and, and they got grit and they're working to make their lives better. So don't tell me you rich lawyer who's living in Manhattan with two Teslas and a, and, and a, and a nanny can't figure this out, right? Yeah. And is this why you decided to sort of uh, write your next book, The Sign Your Work Life? Because you started to yeah. see this a lot? Yeah, people are really unhappy at work. And, you know, I've always liked my jobs. I like all my jobs. I've done startups. I did two startups where I was on the founding team. I did another startup with a friend of mine. I've done consulting for lots of different companies. I worked with Apple. You know, I've really enjoyed all of my jobs. Um, you know, it's sometimes you grow out of a job, you want a new, new thing. So I tried, you know, I was at Apple for seven years. I did 11 portable computers and I just didn't want to do 12. So I thought, well, I'm going to try something. <laughs> but I never, I always enjoyed it. It was never bad. So the people who say I'm disengaged at work, I don't like my job. I'm thinking like these, these pe people, these poor people, they need some help. They need some tools, right? To get, to get energized, to get off of, uh, get off a bad path and get on a new path. And we just thought we had a lot of um, a lot of tools that we could put together that weren't in the first book um, that we prototyped and tested with lots of people that would be helpful. Now, the funny thing, of course, is that book launched on uh, 2020 on February 25th. Went to New York, we had a launch party, <laughs> we did some media. By the time I flew home, the first COVID cases had hit New York, and by March 15th. The world shut down, which meant all the bookstores shut down. Hmm. So um, our, our, our wonderful editor at Knopf, Vicki Wilson, she's amazing, called us about six months ago and said, Greg, we need to reboot the book. I want four new chapters on life after COVID, work after COVID, because I think there's <laughs> something new to say. And we said, yeah, there's a lot new to say. 
And so we're going to, we're going to do a real quick second edition nice. coming out in October in the U S um, called designing your new work life. Cool. <laughs> and, cool. Um, and we, and we, and we did a lot of interviews with, you know, CEOs and CTOs and, and people who are ahead of their talent or HR human resources organizations. Uh, we interviewed the COO of the university of California system, which is 20, 220,000 employees. Wow. Um, what's going to be different after the pandemic and not just the pandemic, but you know, all these other disruptions, social disruptions, global disruptions, uh, you know, po po you know, U.S. political disruptions. So, um, you know, how how do how do people navigate in this disruptive environment? And um, and we think we came up with some new stuff. It's going to be pretty cool. The book will book will come out in paperback, and hopefully, that's a chance to relaunch it into a more uh, normal environment where people can actually go to a bookstore and take yeah. A look. And what are the, some of the new additions that you guys add here? that we haven't talked about in the podcast because we mostly focused on life design, yeah. but how does it well, change? I mean, I'll, give you, I'll give you one. And, you know, this applies to the, the, the pandemic, but also applies to any disruption. So um, you're going along, you're going along and you're in the old, you know, you're doing fine and everything's normal. And then bang, something happens like, like um, we'll say in this case, the pandemic. Okay. So everything shuts down. Okay. So now, Everybody's sitting around going, okay, we're waiting for the next thing. What, like, what's the new, the new normal, right? But that's not actually the way it works. We looked at some work from a guy named William Bridget, um, corporate transformation, other kind of transformations. He says that you're, it, the old thing dies and the new thing starts up. This isn't actually how it happens. The old thing dies. And then you're in this neutral zone for a while where nobody knows what the next thing's going to be. And then slowly that fog clears and the next thing starts up and starts up slowly and then it becomes the new normal. So with that model, if you're, if, if you're in the waiting room right now, you're waiting for things to get better, waiting for things to go back to where they were, you're going to be frustrated because you're like, that's like when you're waiting for the dentist and the you have a two o'clock appointment and it's 2.15 and you're late and the dentist isn't ready and you're getting mad, right? I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. We're not in a waiting room. We are in a neutral zone. And the neutral zone right now is a place that could be a place for growth, but you have to accept it. You know, our, our first rule in, in designing a life is accept. So you, you have to accept you're in the neutral zone, reframe out of the waiting room. You're not in the waiting room because you don't know what you're waiting for. And, and you got to let go of the notion that it'll be like it was, because it won't be like it was. All right. So that applies to the pandemic. And different parts of the world are kind of getting through that zone faster or slower. And, you know, India is, is terrible and Brazil is terrible, but, but the U.S. is, you know, in California, we're going to go back to complete normal uh, in seven days on June 15th. All right, so that's, that's the pandemic. But think about, um, I'm in a job and I know um, automation is coming, right? So AI is going to automate my job. I'm doing uh, accounting, managerial accounting, or I'm doing uh, you know, I'm the guy who reads, uh, you know, x-rays, you know, I'm an uh, x-ray technician. And I know that AI is going to automate that job and it's going to disappear. And now we've had another disruption. Boom, my job, my, 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 I may still have a job, but I see the field is, is ending. And then there's going to be you know, job. What, what's that role look like? What is the Right? I'm still in the neutral zone. Um, but if I'm waiting for my job to come back, that's never going to happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just like it's never going to be like it was before the pandemic. So I, I have to be able to reframe what we call a generative acceptance. I have to accept the change, not be like, uh, you know, I'm just going to be tough and I'll wait till it gets better because it's not going to get better. And you can't be, you know, you can't be depressed. I mean, it's easy to be depressed, right? If you lose your job or you lose, you know, your industry. But think about it, you know, the, the hospitality industry. Um, if you worked in a hotel, well, your job went away. And when, and when the hotels rebuild, they're going to rebuild around resilient systems that have less people in them and more automation in them. So they don't have to have as many people in the, in the, in the, in the service. Um, so you'll have to re reframe and retrain. So you've, you've got to you've got to get this idea of the neutral zone really clear. When a disruption occurs, we don't move from the old to the new. 
we move through a, a period of time which is uncertain, which Bridges calls the neutral zone. And if you frame it in a generative way, and you say, okay, I accept that we're now in the neutral zone. I don't know when the end is, but this is a perfect time to realign my skills, retrain, redo whatever I need to do to get ready for the next thing. Accept that it won't be like the old thing and move into the future with confidence. I think that's a big idea. And I, I love the way uh, Bridges framed it as, as you know, it's not the waiting room. Because when you're in the waiting room, your mindset is uh, this this will be over soon. Mm. And that implies when it's over, we'll go back to what it used to be. It's not going back. And that's hard for people. I mean, if you lost your job, if your industry, you know, has been um, really uh, crippled by this, uh, people are saying, you know, it'll take years for hospitality, hotel, come back. Now, I'm noticing uh for instance, I just read an article that um, all of the cruise ships who have announced that they're going to go back into service, you know, maybe in October or November or December, and, you know, for cruise and, and you have a certificate to take the cruise, um, they're sold out. Yeah. Absolutely sold out. Every, every cruise line. I just read that today in the New York Times. So people will be willing to participate in whatever the new economy is. And I'm sure the experience will be different and the ships will be much cleaner <laughs> and maybe, maybe it'll be really good. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, restaurants, all that stuff, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. And that's amazing how you mentioned that it's not the waiting room. You really have to take that time to maybe optimize your skills or, establish a plan going through the design thinking principles that you mentioned would be awesome also yeah. and um i think this interview has been amazing bill thank you for coming on man is there are there any last words that you want to end with well first of all thank you thanks you so much uh, for inviting me i really enjoy um you know the other the other um posts that you've got on your site are, are great um, I'm pleased to be in such fine company. Um, you know, I think, you know, one time Dave and I had to go, we're on a, a television show in Canada and we thought we had a 15 minute thing and the guy comes to us and says, okay, we had this other thing happen and some news, you know, so you only have, have four minutes. You got to explain the whole thing <laughs> in four minutes. We go. We're professors. We can't explain anything in four minutes. And he said, well, if you can't do it, we, then we're cutting your segment. And we're like, okay, hold on a second. So Dave, Dave came up with this the whole thing in, in 10 words um get curious so this is my, my final my final thing is to tell you here's the whole designing your life thing in in four in 10 words get curious that's the energy that starts it talk to people because the answers in the world radical collaboration try stuff prototype 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 break it into small simple steps prototype and then tell your story get curious talk to people People try stuff, story, 10 words. When you tell your story, hey, this is the journey I'm on. And I'm so curious about them. In person, people want to talk to you. So it starts, it starts the cycle right over again. And then you get curious about new things. And now you're more, you, you've learned more things. So you're more interesting. So more people will tell you. have more prototypes to run and more stories to tell. And that's life design in 10 words. That, that's awesome, Bill. Thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate your time.